Hello, and welcome once again to another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sankoff, the TriDoc, an emergency physician and multiple Ironman finisher coming to you from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. I've been watching with a mixture of interest and amusement the ongoing online phenomenon that is the Ironman Virtual Race Series, or VR. I never really planned on participating in this endeavor, as the whole online format didn't really hold any allure for me, and as I've mentioned before, I don't really need that kind of motivation to train. For me, I can find enough internal motivation until my real races come back at some unknown time in the future. I was interested, though, in seeing how it all came off. And in the end, it seems like a bit of a mixed bag. Certainly, the professional races had some entertainment value, though I've never been a fan of who Iron Man uses for its race day play-by-play calling, and this was made all the worse with the online format. Still, it was kind of nice to see the pros in their own homes, on their own trainers, battling out remotely on an online platform like Ruby. Would have been kind of cool, though, if they could have had more A-list pros instead of some of the B-listers they got, but even then, it was decent entertainment if you're into that kind of thing. Where things kind of went off the rails, though, was in the posting of age group results and the self-promoting social media posts by age groupers that followed. Come on, people. We all know that none of you in the 45 to 49 age group would actually be able to manage 60 kilometers per hour over 40 kilometers, so who do you think you're fooling when you post that kind of rubbish time and then crow about it on Facebook? I think that it would be perfectly fine to just let people do the events and award them for finishing. No need to post results, since everyone knows how easy it is to manipulate them. Besides those of you who strapped your Garmin to the hood of your car, or finessed the settings in Zwift, I'm looking at all of you who ran your 5k run within a minute of the world record. The other mini-scandal that popped up just prior to last weekend's VR3 was the kerfuffle over losing Strava integration. DC Rainmaker did a great job of explaining exactly what went down in that whole fiasco, and there was lots of silliness involved on all sides. But the actions of Iron Man sending out a pretty inflammatory and mostly untrue statement via email wasn't really a very good look. Of course, the biggest losers in the whole thing was, as always, the athletes, many of whom seemed to struggle to get their activities uploaded and counted towards their race, something that, in my mind, anyway, seemed to cause a lot more consternation than it was seemingly worth, but again, I confess to not being terribly interested in this sort of thing. Still, in the end, I'm happy that Iron Man, among many other players in the endurance sport world, are doing this. Athletes are adrift right now, and with continuous cascades of races being postponed or canceled, Cancelled, something like the VR series can be a tiny glimmer of hope to keep people moving forward through the dark days of isolation and pandemic. Please, though, just accept that it really isn't anything more than what it really is a brief distraction, entertainment, and a source of positive motivation for those in need of it. I guess it's a fine balance, right? On the show today, George Cespedes is a gregarious and affable guy who brings his positive outlook and ebullient personality to everything he does, including his very successful and ever-growing Facebook group, The Tri-Animals. I wanted to talk to him about his history in the sport, the origin of the Facebook group, and of course, why all the plaid? And that's a reference you'll understand, specifically if you're a group member. So I reached out on social media, we connected, and we got together for a chat. On Motivation in Isolation, I'm joined this time around by professional triathletes and new parents, as well as founders of the Cupcake Cartel, Elise Salzmark and Callum Millward. Staying motivated without races is one thing for age groupers, it's another thing altogether when your livelihood depends on it. Elise and Cal share their secrets and tips for staying the course. First off, though, I have a medical question to answer. Foot pain is a common complaint amongst runners and triathletes, and one of the common conditions that can cause it, especially amongst middle-aged triathletes, is Morton's neuroma. What is this affliction, and how can it be treated? Well, I have the answers to that coming up right now. Foot pain can be really difficult to deal with and is often impossible to ignore or overcome. And the reason for this is because the foot is highly innervated with both pain and sensory fibers throughout the sole of the foot. Furthermore, the structure of the foot is really densely packed with bones, muscles, tendons, blood vessels, and more. So any degree of injury or inflammation 
causes everything to really get kind of squished together. There's really not a lot of room for any extra fluid or any blood in the form of a hematoma to really get into that space. And so it really causes a significant amount of pain, even with minor injuries. Now, an unfortunately common ailment that is especially painful and is seen increasingly in middle age and in older folks is Morton's neuroma. Generally, this problem arises between the third and fourth toes and is much more commonly seen in women than men. It's often referred to as a benign tumor of the nerve, but this is a misnomer because it's not actually a tumor. What Morton's neuroma actually is, is a thickening of the tissue that surrounds the nerve. And it's technically referred to as a degenerative neuropathy that arises from fibrosis of the common interdigital nerve. So you have five interdigital nerves that run between each of the toes. And when you get a fibrosis or a neuropathy that occurs in the interdigital nerve between the third and fourth toes, you get what appears to be a swelling, and that's called a Morton's neuroma. Now, symptoms of the neuroma can include the sensation of a mass like a marble in the foot, and this often radiates towards the ball of the foot and causes a significant amount of pain. Occasionally, numbness and tingling also can be uh, perceived by individuals with this problem, and that can spread to the tips of the toes. Now, there are four possible theories regarding the development of the uh, neuroma, and all of these have been investigated uh, as they've been proposed with respect to the development of this problem. The first of these is chronic traction damage. Essentially, in the motion of running and walking, the digital nerve is uh, repeatedly stretched, and over the course of time, this stretching causes a certain amount of damage. The nerve Uh, surrounding or the nerve uh, protective fibers are are responding to this by increasing their size and uh, width, and therefore you end up with this neuroma. A second uh, possible theory is the inflammatory environment due to an intermetatarsal bursitis. So you have bursa that uh, run along the uh, bones of the foot, the metatarsals, and if you have uh, inflammation there, Uh, in the form of a bursitis, then you have sort of an inflamed environment that encompasses the interdigital nerve, and it is this environment that results in the fibrosis of the nerve itself and eventually the swelling and the neuroma. A third theory is uh, felt uh, to be uh, compression by the deep transverse intermetatarsal ligament. So ligaments are fibrous structures that connect bone to bone. And between the toes, you have uh, these uh, dense ligaments that uh, connect the metatarsal structures. These have to be incredibly strong because of the uh, stresses on the foot as uh, you continually put your weight down on the bony structures. And occasionally, these uh, ligaments can uh, exert influence on the interdigital nerve. And over the course of time, it has been proposed that uh, the compression of the interdigital nerve by these ligaments can result in injury and eventually swelling and the neuroma. And finally, there is the um, uh, fourth theory for the development of the neuroma, and that involves ischemia of the vasa nervorum. Now, the vasa nervorum are the tiny capillaries that run alongside the nerve, and it is felt that uh, because of compression or other problems that these uh, tiny blood vessels can become compromised, and as a result, you end up with an inflammatory reaction and eventually the same kind of swelling. Now, it's not entirely understood which of these theories is true and which of them is the direct consequence for the development of Martin's neuroma, but all of them have been proposed. None of them have been definitive proven. Nonetheless, the treatment of uh, Martin's neuroma is essentially the same no matter what the cause. Initially, it is conservative, progressing then to infiltrations and then surgery. Essentially, if the previous steps fail, you move on to the more invasive steps. And the uh, therapeutic algorithm, uh, which has been tested in the literature over uh, time, has uh, been shown to be quite consistent in this fashion. Now, the treatments considered as conservative consist in educating patients to avoid tight shoes, manipulation and use of insoles or other special orthotic appliances, anything that essentially relieves pressure in the area where the neuroma exists. 
The second, uh, more invasive uh, type of treatment for Martin's aroma is the infiltrative treatments, and these include injections of local anesthetics, steroids, or alcohol even, and percutaneous radiofrequency ablation. All of these infiltrative methods work by causing the fibrotic parts of the nerve, the neuroma itself, to simply shrink away and thereby reduce the amount of pressure in the area. And finally, if the infiltrative treatments are unsuccessful, you can move into surgical treatments, which consist either of neurectomy or neurolysis. Neurectomy being actual removal of the nerve, or neurolysis being uh, a splaying or cutting of the nerve to remove the uh, swollen part. Now, if you have a neuroma, you may be in the middle of one of these therapies, or you may be considering one of them. And the question at that point for you is, uh, is there any evidence to support one kind of these therapies over another? So to try and answer this question, I sought out a paper from the medical literature that uh, had uh, the authors report the results of a systematic review. In it, they reviewed all of the studies on this subject and selected only the most methodologically sound ones to review in depth and include as a means of making some kind of conclusions and recommendations for patients who might be suffering from a Morton's neuroma. And what they found was that conservative treatment in which orthoses seemed to be the most common tool used, 48% of patients would have relief of symptoms, but 47% of those would end up having some kind of recurrence. So essentially, half of patients who have conservative treatment will have relief, but half of those will go on to have recurrence. So basically, a quarter of patients can get relief just with conservative measures alone. Among patients who then go on to have infiltrative measures, the success rate is significantly higher, with 81% of patients having radiofrequency ablation getting uh, total relief versus 71% who have alcohol injections into the neuroma and 51% uh, who get uh, corticosteroid injections. With respect to complications after infiltrative treatment... Uh, the most common ones tended to be a hematoma or a bruise, uh, as well as persistent pain, followed by temporary near nerve irritation, which can result in some tingling or uh, some kind of electric shock type uh, sensations, infection, severe pain, and uh, numbness as well. The global rate of complications for patients who underwent infiltrative measures was only 3%. And uh, if you broke that down, it would actually be a little bit higher for the radiofrequency ablation at 5% and 3% for alcohol injections. Symptoms would tend to recur in about 14% of patients. That's overall. Uh, the rate tended to be much higher for those with steroid injection, in which it was almost a quarter, 9% after radiofrequency and 12% after alcohol injection. So if you're going to have infiltrative treatment, it would seem that radiofrequency ablation tends to be the best way to go. For those patients who failed both uh, conservative and infiltrative therapy, operative therapy was by far the most successful of the options, with 88% having a successful rate for neurectomy, and that is removal of the nerve, versus a 94% success rate for the decompression of the nerve. What that involves is a cutting of the ligament that the nerve runs over in order to relieve any compression of the nerve and therefore relieve any of the uh, compression of the neuroma that would be causing some of the symptoms. In terms of failure of uh, the uh, surgical processes, uh, for both open and uh, minimally invasive resection and decompression procedures, it was only 4%. So operative procedures had the highest success rate, the lowest failure rate, and while complication rates were as high as 1 in 5, those complications usually tended to be pretty minor. Now, unfortunately, none of the studies that uh, were included in this review article randomized patients to one therapy versus another. That is to say, none of them actually went straight to surgery and compared that to, say, infiltrative treatment. So it's difficult to compare the therapies to each other, except to look at each on their own merits. Still, it does appear that Morton's neuroma is best managed either by infiltrative, specifically radiofrequency ablation, or surgical management. Now, surgery for Morton's neuroma is relatively minor, but because the foot is such a delicate structure, the recovery can be pretty prolonged. While the surgery only takes about 30 minutes, recovery can actually range for up to two months or so. Initially, after surgery, patients have to be non-weight-bearing for several days, and then will go on to wear a hard sole shoe for several weeks, and won't return to running for upwards of two months. Still, given the alternative, 
surgery seems like the best way to go given the odds of recurrence with other methods and the low potential for failure. So if you're in the middle of your season and you're beginning to experience symptoms related to a Morton's neuroma, you kind of have a couple of options. If it were me, I would certainly use infiltrative options such as radiofrequency ablation during the season. So I wouldn't have to miss any specific amount of times and I would have a pretty high likelihood of having success. However, once the season was over, if I was still having any degree of symptoms, I would move to surgery pretty quickly as that does seem to have the highest rate of success, the lowest rate of recurrence, and while complication rates being 1 in 5, those complications tended to be not that important. Do you have a question for me to consider answering on the podcast? Well, send it to me at tri underscore doc at icloud.com. George Cespedes is a level one USAT triathlon coach. He has completed four Ironman and innumerable 70.3 races. But his greatest accomplishment, if you ask him, and I will, is tri animals. What I thought was just a Facebook group, but in fact is so much more. Well, George is here today joining me on the line from Colorado Springs to talk to me about his experience in triathlon and, of course, about tri animals. Welcome to the Tri Doc Podcast, George. Thank you, Jeff. How are you today? You know, I'm doing terrific. Uh, it, we're in the middle of uh, some difficult times, but, uh, you know, y- you make do with uh, what you have, and I think uh, I'm fortunate to have what I do have. And uh, how are you doing with all of this? Uh, I'm doing really well. Luckily for both my wife and I, we predominantly work from home. Um, so we have been spending lots of time together yeah. and, and, and our dogs are very much happy to have us here all the time. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so George, uh, tell me about, uh, what it is that got you into triathlon and what it is that got you to be the success that you are, uh, the man about town as you will, uh, for triathlon. Uh, well, how I got into triathlon is actually a really, really funny story, um, you know, obviously, uh, when I was a kid, um, Wide World of Sports would televise the Ironman race. Uh, and this is—I'm talking back when the Punto sisters were the champions. This is pre-Dave Scott. Yeah. Um, then, you know, as I got older, watched a couple of more uh, Ironman races, and for some reason, it was always one of those things like, I really want to do this. I really want to do this. But you know, my athletic prowess was you know, as a baseball player. And as John Cruck was famous for saying, I'm not an athlete, I'm a baseball player. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, I played baseball, uh, through college, um, went to New York, was working on wall street and just got ridiculously out of shape. And my best friend at the time, Howard, um, got transferred to Prudential Beach in London and he gave me his health club membership and his exact words were, I'm giving you this health club membership because I'm concerned for your health because when you cut yourself shaving, you bleed gravy. <laughs> so um, so I joined, I, you know, I took his health club and just would just so happened that um, a week after I took his health club membership, I got laid off. First time I was ever laid off in my life. Uh, so my routine became wake up in the morning take the subway into Manhattan, work out at the gym, get dressed, and then go on interviews. Took me about three weeks to get a job. And you know the old saying, it takes three weeks to become a habit. And there it was. I became, uh, I became, um, I don't want to say obsessed with exercise, but exercise became a big part of who I was. Um, And then a couple of years later, when I started working in the health and fitness industry. I left Wall Street to go work in the health and fitness industry. Um, one of the guys who worked with, who worked at the club with me, one of his clients' nephew happened to be the vice president of the World Triathlon Corporation at that time. So I got a lottery slot for Kona in 1993, and uh, and all of a sudden I had to train for this event, and. The rest is history. Wow. So what was that like going to Kona? I mean, was that your first Ironman? Was the Kona it, Ironman? It was my first Ironman. It was my third or fourth overall triathlon. Um, yeah, the longest I had done since then. I did the uh, 
the Tupper Lake Tin Man. It used to, the yeah. half Iron Man used yeah. to be called Tin Man. Yes, I remember I did, that. I did the Tupper Lake Tin Man uh, earlier that year, and then uh, went to. Kona. So, so you've referenced now a couple of things that are near and dear to my heart, being from Montreal originally, the Punto sisters, of course, both French Quebecers. Uh, mm -hmm. I know of them uh, quite well. And uh, Tupper Lake, also uh, pretty much in my backyard, uh, the Tin Man. In, in the, I never did that race, but I, I knew of it uh, quite well. Uh, so what was that like going to Kona back in 93? This was... Uh, I guess the race was probably, it was well established at that point, but it certainly wasn't, uh, yeah, I guess at that point it was, it had become pretty big. Uh, was it quite the spectacle that it is today? It was, it was amazing. And I always tell people, you know, I'm, I'm a huge sports fan and always have been a huge sports fan. And I always said that, that having the opportunity to go to Kona back then, um, to me was a lot like being invited to the world series and getting to play. Yeah. So that's a, that's a um, great analogy. Yeah. So although, you know, I was, I think I, my time was just over 12 hours. I nowhere near, you know, n nowhere near any type of podium or any type of good, what we'd call a good time today, but it was, it was such a feeling of accomplishment just to do it back then. And that was, that was before Iron Man became the big, um, uh, conglomerate that it is now. Yeah. Um, so tell me about tri animals. Uh, that is, uh, really become quite a huge endeavor. Uh, certainly I came to know of it, uh, on Facebook and, uh, thought, uh, it was just a Colorado thing. But, uh, as you have told me, uh, just before we started recording, this is actually, uh, a worldwide phenomenon. So tell me about the history of tri animals, uh, where it came from and, uh, how it's gotten to be what it is. Well, Trianimals was started back in the late 80s in New York, uh, actually out on Far Rockaway, um, by, a group of, by a group of people, and they invited me to join back in 1991, um, This back when I did my first ever marathon, uh, back in 1991, and um, I became, I became part of this group. And, you know, as, as we got older and we went our separate ways, the group kind of fell apart. Um, and then I moved, you know, from New York to Texas, from Texas to Colorado. And in 2012, um, a friend of mine who knew that I had done an Ironman asked me if I could help her, uh, complete the Boulder 70.3. Uh, and I said that I would be happy to do that. And, um, uh, and my wife at the time, um, uh, made a comment about me living in the glory of things that I had done in the past. Uh, and I took that as a challenge. And then I decided that I would do the Boulder 70.3 in 2012 as well. Um, uh, and that, that's what led me to become a coach. And, you know, it started my whole other life, um, uh, outside of, um, life and health insurance. Uh, and then when I decided to start my, uh, coaching business, I wanted to use the name tri animal endurance. Um, and then that led me to the idea of re rekindling the tri animals group. Um, uh, and it's become a worldwide community of triathletes. And what's the deal with the tartan? <laughs> I had to ask. So, it's been driving me crazy. I, I've never posted a question on the on the Facebook page because I figured I, it would make me look stupid. So I, I had no, to go right to the source. Not not at all. I uh, it, there's for years it's been a big joke that every pair of shorts I own is plaid, uh, and and I'm always I'm always in plaid shorts. And when we first started Tri Animals, we had these really sharp uh, yellow, red, and black kits, and uh, and one day, one of the members, Ricky Davis, down in uh, Arkansas, he looked at me and he said, well, with as much as you like plaid, why don't we have plaid kits? And I was like, oh, my God, plaid kits. And uh, lo and behold, the plaid kits were born. And, uh, and now it's become, it's become part of who we are. Um, we've, we've also nicknamed the kits the plaid ass kits. Nice. 
I, and if you're not a member of the Tri Animals uh, group, I, I highly recommend you take a look. It's a very, um, it's a very positive, very, uh, very lighthearted group, uh, and uh, they do uh, have a lot of. Um, uh, good stuff in their store. Uh, they just posted yesterday some uh, COVID-appropriate uh, masks uh, that were appropriately plaid, and uh, I thought uh, <laughs> I thought that was great. That was great to see. So, uh, what do you see as uh, sort of the future for Tri Animals? Have you got any plans for where you'd like to see it go? Well, I you know I'd like to continue to grow the the group. Um, you know, as I said, we're a worldwide community of triathletes. So don't think of it as a club. There are no dues. Uh, but the fact that there are over 2000 members makes us appealing to different vendors. Um, so they're willing to give us, uh, large discounts, um, to become one of our sponsors. So my goal is to, uh, hopefully bring us to about, uh, 5,000 members by, 2025, if not sooner, um, and just get to the point that when you go to a race anywhere in the world, you're going to see someone who's a member of Tri Animals that you can that you can connect with. Um, my wife and I uh, last year we were in uh, Iceland. She had won uh, she had won one of her company's uh, trips. So we were in we were in Iceland and the captain of a ferry boat that we took across was a tri animal. Huh. And and we had never met him. He had joined through Facebook and and lo and behold, here we here we've met someone that we've never met in the world before and they were a tri animal. And uh, so we're going to hopefully if everything straightens out. Uh, we plan on going to Portugal this year to do the 70.3 and a couple of the Icelandic tri animals are going to join us in Portugal. Cause I didn't, I never knew this. Portugal is like their Miami beach, right. you know, they right. go from Iceland to, yeah. to Portugal. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. It's nice when you have that kind of community and you can have those kinds of connections and when they just surprise you like that. So how, uh, how do you sort of display your tri animal, uh, you know, membership as you're, you know, out and about not doing triathlons. Are you wearing like? Do you have something uh, clothing wise, or what is it that 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 let that tipped off the captain? Oh, I have uh, no. He uh, nothing tipped him off. We didn't realize that uh, that we had even met each other until we posted on Facebook and he saw on the tri animals page on Facebook. So we actually interacted with him on the, on the boat without knowing oh, that we I were see. tri animals until after the fact. Gotcha. But, but I do often wear uh, a tri animal hoodie or a tri animal t-shirt. Um, uh, so gotcha. I, d I, I do represent well, yes. I look good in plaid. Yes. <laughs> That's great. So could you tell me uh, what are, uh, besides Kona, uh, what are some of the highlights from your triathlon, your personal triathlon career? Um, well, I mean, obviously Kona, but um, back in, so, so my highlights are kind of like lowlights that I've overcome. Back in 2017, um, I went to uh, Victoria and got a roll down slot for the world championships that year in um, Chattanooga, 2017 70.3 world championships in Chattanooga. And seven weeks before the race, I was at a local race here in Colorado and I hit a deer while I was on my bike. Mm. Uh, ended up with a uh, severe concussion, lots of road rash and a fractured, uh, right fibula. And, uh, seven weeks later, long story short, I went down to, uh, Chattanooga and did the 70.3, um, against all the advice of everyone in the world. Um, uh, so that was probably not the smartest thing I've ever done. 
Well, you're here to tell me about it, so it didn't didn't uh, you know? It's not all bad. Um, right. How'd the bike end up? That's really the most important question. Right? The, uh, the bike ended up really well. Um, you know, the, the the funny thing about the accident in 2017 was I'm I'm riding downhill at a race, and all of a sudden, out of my peripheral vision, I see a deer start to jog across the course and then i wake up in the ambulance so not you know i have no recollection of the accident at all except that you know i know that i hit a deer and i was told by people that it didn't look real good Mm. um but last year at um iron man canada in the seven again in the 70.3 i was in uh i was in a pretty bad accident um shattered my collarbone and broke a couple of ribs and uh and it was funny because my wife was uh was doing the race and i knew that she was behind me and i actually had them hide my bike while i was in the ambulance so that when she would ride by she wouldn't stop and she would go on and continue and finish the race um I got yelled at pretty good by her for that too. So. <laughs> well, good for you. That's uh, again, you know, I, she she finished. She did fine, so it all worked out well. Good. That's pretty good stuff. Um, uh, this was Ironman Canada in Whistler. Yep. And mm-hmm. uh, I understand that this year you are scheduled to go to Penticton if it uh, if it happens. I was scheduled to go to Penticton. Uh, we had uh, lots of work situations uh with my wife and i were both going to go to pentec and it was going to be her first full uh iron man um but we had some scheduling issues so we deferred that to next year and we're going to go to cozumel this year and that'll be her first uh, okay her first try at All a right. full Wow. And I've already I've already done the Cozumel full, and it's one of my favorite places to race. Excellent. Well, I, I'm hopeful that uh, I'm scheduled for Penticton, and I'm hopeful I won't be forced into deferring. So we'll see what happens. And uh, did you see that they just added another twenty Kona slots? No, not twenty, sixty. So they added sixty slots for 2020, and they kept the forty slots for 2021. So there's now a hundred slots. So there's a hundred slot. Oh my God. I yeah. thought they were, I thought they went from 40 to 60. No, they went from so. 40 to a hundred. But the thing is, is it's not clear how they're going to allocate those slots. Uh, in some races, uh, like in the Chinese races where they've had both 70.3 and Kona slots, they've allowed people to double dip and take both. Not clear to me if they're going to allow people to take slots for both 2020 and 2021, or if they're only going to allow people to take one and then you'll have to choose. So it's a, uh, we'll see. I, anyways, I, it's kind of academic because I honestly, I think it's 50, 50 if this race happens at all. So we will, we will see and we will see. Um, George, uh, as a coach, uh, how are you managing your athletes, uh, through, uh, the pandemic situation with isolation? Have you had issues keeping your athletes motivated? Uh, have you, uh, done anything special to try and adapt for the lack of swimming? Um, so I, I'm a coach through TriDot. Um, so the, the TriDot system allocates and, and works the programs out for the athletes. Um, what, what's important and what one of the things I like most about TriDot is it lets us spend more time working with the athletes as far as, uh, motivational, you know, um, almost like an amateur psychologist. And, and I feel like we're, we're doing a lot more of that. Now we're spending a lot more time communicating with our athletes. You know, most of them are riding bikes indoors on Zwift or Ruby or whatever, program it is that they prefer to use indoors uh you know and then occasionally running outdoors but running a lot on treadmills as well um and it's i i think keeping them motivated and keeping their eye on the prize especially with the way races have been canceled you know it used to be well you know still is where you know you have a race that you're that you're scheduled for and that's your that's when you want to peak and you know everything is designed for that, but with with the race schedules being as in flux as they are right now, um, a lot of a lot of athletes are just concerned about if they're going to race. So it's more about keeping them uh, focused. 
Well, George uh, Cespedes is a level one USA2 triathlon coach. He's a multiple Ironman and 70.3 finisher. But most importantly, he is the founder, the operator, the uh, creative drive behind the Tri Animals Group, which can be found on Facebook. And I will have the link for that in the show notes. George, thanks for taking some time today to join me uh, on the TriDoc podcast. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. I hope you have a great day. Please stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Yes, thanks, and same to you. Elise Salzmark is a professional triathlete from the Sunshine Coast in Australia. She has had a successful career at both the 70.3 and Ironman distances, including fourth place in her Ironman debut in New Zealand. Callum Millward has been a professional triathlete since 2006 and has wins at the 70.3 distance and second in Ironman Louisville and has been to Kona as a professional three times. Elise and Callum met on Facebook of all places, I guess that's the way things are done these days, and since 2016 have been living together in Noosa Heads where they have been running the Cupcake Cartel for the past three years, a team that I am extremely happy to be a part of this year. They are both managing uh, their own motivation in isolation, and Elise, as a Triathlon Australia coach, is joining me today uh, with Callum and her baby Taj on the TriDoc podcast to talk about staying motivated while in isolation. Welcome to you all, Elise and Callum and Taj. Thanks for having us. (laughs) All right, guys. Um, I have uh, had a great time following along on the Cupcake Cartel Facebook page, just watching uh, how, you know, many of uh, the team members are struggling with motivation. Others are doing uh, pretty well with it. How are you guys uh, managing as professional triathletes, not really knowing when the the race season may or may not resume? I guess we're in uh, polar situations right now. So, 2018, I sort of had a sabbatical. I um, needed a year off. Uh, I was sort of forced off with injury. Um, Elise was carrying our baby Taj, who's five months old, so she was going through, I guess, motherhood. Since that's happened, um, we've both been adapting to parenthood, and Elise had a huge motivation to get back to fitness, get back to racing, and I guess with that, you know, there's a lot of challenges as well. And just observing the way she's training has been super motivating. Um, And for myself, uh, I'm just getting back to enjoying it and getting back to having fitness and had a a schedule planned out. Um, And then with this uncertainty, uh, you know what? I don't mind it too much because I kind of figure everything happens for a reason. And I think a lot of people will adapt to it and there will also be a lot of people who will struggle to face the uncertainty. And I think one of the biggest adaptions is probably going to be pool closures. I'm not sure what it's like um, in the US right now, but here like all the pools are shut down. And for a lot of people, you know, the first thing in the morning they do when they wake up is go to swim squad. Um, So it sets up their day. And now with that being pulled from under you, it's a big adaption. Yeah, it's the same thing here. The pools uh, were actually one of the first things that got closed, and that was really the first uh, major kind of inconvenience for my athletes that I coach. How about you, Elise? How are you uh, managing with your own motivation? And then also, how are you kind of managing your athletes that you're coaching? Sure, yeah. So um, like like I was saying, it was a long year off last year having Taj, and I was super excited to get back to racing and was starting to build some really good fitness and almost ready for a start line. So um, it's definitely an uh, practicing the art of patience a bit longer here to, to get back into things. Um, I think we're relatively lucky here in Noosa because, like I said, the, uh, like Cal said, the, the pools have been closed, but we do still have access to a huge coastline worth of beaches. And um, while the beaches are being policed very very closely we do have the opportunity to open water swim so um largely it's business as usual training wise i guess it's just getting your head around that uncertainty that we don't know when we've got a start line so you know in terms of myself and the athletes i coach it was really a matter of sitting down and um i guess adjusting those goal posts and you know we're very goal focused all of us usually so rather than having race goals in place it was really more developing some goals that are more process focused for myself and athlete and the athletes that I coach um and just kind of getting back to basics like 
having a chat about why they entered the sport. And for most of them, it was actually, um, you know, for fitness or to meet friends or to, to challenge themselves and that kind of thing. And, um, yeah, so a, a lot of the goals or, or the reasons why we got into the sport are process focused as opposed to, to race focused. So, so getting back to those and developing some short term training goals, I guess, whether it's like a FTP test goal or, um, you know, it might be a 5K run PB that they can do solo, thing, little things like that to keep things fun. And or Zwift races, that's another huge one. So, Lots of little things you can do to stay motivated in the meantime. Yeah, and I, I you know, that's a really important point, and I kind of uh, alluded to that in the last episode of the podcast, where I, uh, I kind of mentioned, uh, you know, how important it is to think about why you got into triathlon, and you know, not, there's no question, and it's really you, you can't overstate the importance of a finish line but the fact of the matter is is that people got into endurance sport for so many reasons and you know like you said you know it's fitness it's losing weight it's just being a you know able to handle stress all of those things are still there and just reminding people about that can go a long way to keeping motivation up um you mentioned open water uh, swimming as uh, an alternative which is great uh, most people don't have that i mean there's no way to really replicate the feel of the water but do you think dry land training can at least keep people at least prepared to get back in the water when the pool's open? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's obviously you can't completely replicate the feel of the water and just your body position. Um, there are a few things you could do, uh, just your, your standard sort of um, dry land training exercises, your core, your stabilizers. Um, and during regular maintenance and regular training, you might only do a 20 minutes a day, but you might want to bolster that up a little bit. Um, if you have access to stretch cords, that's always a good way to, you know, sort of keep your lats activated and work on a couple of, uh, different areas there. Um, I haven't used cords in ever, um, but that would be probably the most specific way. I still see Andy Potts using them before races where he does a dry land warm-up. So he's one of the best swimmers, so it's clearly still relevant. Um, the other one was uh, you've seen a lot of people now uh, buy those stretchy bungee cords, uh, which holds them in a stationary position. That's another way just to try and get through a couple of months of lockdown. So there are ways around it. The biggest is probably um, – just trying to get your head around it, honestly, because the pool environment is so structured and most of the time you're taking instructions from a coach, you're meeting squad mates, uh, and now you're, I guess, trying to find the motivation to, um, you know, get set up in a spare room or your lounge or your garage and uh, do a dry land session, which um, is going to feel a little different. Yeah. What do you guys miss uh, most since all this started, aside from swims, obviously? But what do, you, what do you miss, I mean, either within the sport or outside of the sport? Sure. Um, I think that we're in a sport where one of my favorite things about the sport is the people in it. And um, for me, I guess, being a, a new mom, it's not just the swimming, um, the squad, I guess, that I miss, the actual swims. It's It's the social aspect. So... For me, that's my weekly interaction with a group of adults that are that are my friends at the pool, and um, you know we quite enjoy getting out for group rides with one or two friends. Um, Cal and I don't often get to ride together anymore because one of us is always home with Taj. But you know, uh, yeah, the social aspect of doing a nice long run in the trails or or, or a ride, and and the opportunity to travel—that's probably one of my one of my other favourite aspects of the sport—is getting to travel, whether it's domestically or internationally, to the races. And um, I mean, we're, I, I love where we live, but travel is a big part of our our year usually, and it's quite unusual to be staying put for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Do you guys have any suggestions for people who would be listening to this on on how to deal with this, both uh, physically and emotionally, to to keep moving forward, both with their motivation and their training? I think uh, for those that have a coach, it would be best to consult with them because you can offload a bit of that, I guess, anxiety to them and and have someone who um, is invested in you and maybe can offer a broader picture um, for those who are self-coached, um, it might be a time to, I guess, work on a weakness and, you know, that can be the same for someone who is coached as well. So 
whenever there's some kind of adversity like this, it's always an opportunity. I don't mind when um, this, you know, I've done well in races before where it's been weather affected or um, we've had several swims cancelled or the bikes reduced Boise, Idaho one year where it was so cold. It was like around mid thirties, it was freezing. Um, so whenever there's a bit of mayhem and, and chaos, I figure, you know, like there's going to be people who adapt to it. Um, the other thing is, you know, so one, you could work on a weakness too. Um, I would just recommend trying to be consistent. Uh, so that might just be, you know, if you, if you regularly swim four times a week and you're only motivated to do two, just try and try and get the blood going and do something else, you know, maybe take the dog for an extra long walk or spend some time with the family or just uh, try and keep your head up and keep going with something and, and get yourself out of bed and, and um, be prepared that, you know, we could get an email any day now saying that, you know, this race is on in eight weeks' time and uh, there will be a lead-in time, but uh, the better prepared you can keep yourself now, the easier the adaptation will be to uh, sort of full training again. And do you guys have any specific fears going forward, uh, either personally or for the sport of triathlon uh, in general? Um, I think probably one of my biggest concerns is how it's going to affect the event companies. So um, Ironman's obviously, I guess, the biggest one um, that we all know of and and do their races regularly. But there's also so many smaller event companies where – you know, they're relying on external contractors for whether it be timing or barricades or like all these all these companies that go into running events and um, I guess it will just be really sad if all those those companies are adversely affected or go under and we have a lot less race opportunities which affects the sport hugely, you know. Yeah. We we have several people even on our team who are tied up in event management. Um, with we know friends who are tied up with um, the timing or catering and it's easy to knock Ironman or some of these local events who are not who are only giving partial refunds and I think a lot of people need to remember that you know goodie bags and medals and and bottles have all been pre-purchased anticipation of these events and that's a lot of revenue tied up in cash flow is king right now and um, people maybe just need to keep a, an eye on that as well and um, you know, it's easy to knock Iron Man, but that is the livelihood of our, you know, community and we need those events. Um, for us personally as a team, you know, it's affected us a little bit, but not as bad as some other um obviously industries. So largely being online, we don't have overheads. Um we're friends who have overheads with um warehouses or fixed rental costs and I have an auntie and uncle in New Zealand who have a uh, travel business and they're all having to lay off staff and, I mean, I think there's something like 6 million Australians right now, which is about uh, 25% of the population where they've got no job and they're applying for like a government benefit and it's just it's just a tough situation and that has a flow-on effect as well. So the economy can quickly come to a halt and I know there's people dying to get businesses back up and running. Um, but at the same time, this virus could come back in a second or third wave, you know, I've read. So we need to be careful. And you can't really put a cost on human lives. You know, this is unprecedented times and they're comparing it to the 1930s depression and a great recession. And, you know, it's, it is kind of scary in a way. But I guess we just have to sort of look after each other and realize, you know, triathlon needs to take a step back for a hot second. Yeah. Yeah, those are all excellent points and things that I've alluded to in the past uh, podcasts. Uh, I think that uh, it's easy to get caught up, uh, especially when we're all scared. Uh, we're all scared for ourselves and you kind of like, you know, boy, that few hundred dollars I spent on that race entry, I could really use that now. But as I've mentioned myself, and as you just mentioned, you know, that's money spent. I mean, that's not like they're sitting on that money uh, until the race is done. That money is is spent way in advance. And uh, it's not like they can just hand it back. Uh, plus, Ironman employs people. And if they give that money back, then they can't pay their employees. And uh, that's a problem for them as well. Um, it sounds like they're working really quite diligently, you know, behind the scenes. They're rescheduling, like we just got another email um, from all the rescheduled um, pro races and some are postponed. And so they're, they're working pretty hard behind the scenes to come to a good solution for 
Kona qualification and Kona this year and everything, um, yeah, it's, it'll be a tough position for them to be in right now as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, any final thoughts about uh, just, you know, how people can refocus their, you know, I, I really like what you said about, uh, you know, refocusing their ambitions and refocusing their sort of tasks and training to, you know, smaller goals. But, you know, just in terms of keeping their motivation, because I know a lot of people, I, I've seen a lot of posts online uh, about people just like, I have no motivation today, what am I going to do? You know, any specific thoughts that you might have to try and help people kind of, you know, regain that spark to keep going? Yeah, I think um, I think it's just really important in times like this to focus on what you can do. And it's almost a little bit like how you'd treat an injury. You know, if you have a running injury, there's kind of two ways you can approach it. You can throw in the towel and have six months off completely and let your swimming and biking tend to, you know, to poo as well. Or you can focus on what you can do. You can focus on your strength. You can focus on, you know, for a lot of people in the world right now, all they can do is bike and run. So focus on make, giving yourself a killer bike run. Um, yeah, bre- I think breaking down the small goals is, is a big one. Um, and just if you need to have a little break now to reset and then start fresh, then then do it because when you – yeah, I think if you can put together a solid plan and have a structure, it, it really helps. I think there's probably a lot of athletes floundering around at the moment without a plan to follow or without any kind of – Um, You know, a lot of us know what what to do when we're prepping specifically for a race, but when we're technically in a really long off-season now, our training kind of needs to reflect that. And, um, yeah, build some base miles or or whatever you've got to do in the off-season to to give yourself the best chance while races start up again. Excellent advice. Well, Elise Salzmark and Callum Millward are professional triathletes. Uh, They both live in Noosa Head in uh, Australia. Uh, They join me today with their uh, adorable baby Taj, who has uh, contributed little oohs and ahs in the background happily. (laughs) Thank you so much for uh, joining me on the TriDoc podcast today. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. Cheers. And that's it for another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Links to the medical references as well as to everything else discussed on the show can be found in the show notes at www.tridocpodcast.podbean.com. If you've made it this far, then perhaps you're interested in coaching services. Well, please visit www.tridoccoaching.com where you can find a lot of information about me and the services that I provide. You can also follow me on the TriDoc Podcast Facebook page, TriDoc Coaching on Instagram, and the TriDoc Coaching YouTube channel, where I promise there will be some more content added soon. The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at www.reverbnation.com, where I hope that you'll visit and give small independent bands a chance. The TriDoc Podcast will be back again soon with another listener question for me to answer. An interview with Jay Weber, a USAT coach and, more importantly, official, to talk about the specifics of what it's like to be on the back of those motorcycles riding along the race course. We'll also have another episode of Motivation in Isolation. But until then, train hard, train healthy.